All right. I think we're ready to um, start. It's fantastic to um, see you all again. And um, again, I hope that these sessions are giving you some different things to think about in relation um, to Holy Spirit and also um, maybe confirming and bringing back some things that you might not have thought about for a while as well. I think this has done that for me as well in some respects. So, um, so yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's... Um, we're and the one this week, which is week four, the Holy Spirit and injustice, and we have two to go after this. I do just want to mention that I'm not going to be available to be physically with you next week, sadly, so we are going to be recording the session for next week, but I will be around for the final week to do it live as we are now. So um, I want to show you this to start out. Get a load of this. This is brilliant. Serving one another. I love how one of them actually pushes it twice just to make sure that the other cat's getting it. And <clears throat> that is so sweet. Um, so that's a big part of what we're talking about tonight. Um, we're looking at Holy Spirit and injustice, or a bigger title might be injustice and social justice. And I do want to open with a prayer that you can see in front of you here. This is from the Revised Common Lectionary. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Make our hearts bold with your love, for one, with love for one another. Pour out your spirit upon all people, that we may live your justice and in praise and sing in praise. I'm really sorry, I just realized I can't see it all because of, uh, there we go. I'm going to start that again. I apologize. Make our hearts bold with love for one another and pour out your spirit upon all people that we may live your justice and sing in praise the new song of your marvellous victory. Amen. <clears throat> so I started in week one by saying something about how the Holy Spirit was poured out in a limited or a different way in the Old Testament. And then Joel says in Joel 2.28, he the prophesies, that the spirit will be poured out on all flesh. So the fact that there is a prophecy that is predicting this, and then in the day of Pentecost, Peter says those words, this is the day that is the fulfillment of the prophecy of John. So the prophecy is fulfilled, and it says all flesh, and that simply means, as you can see, as I've got in lovely big letters here, everyone. And... <clears throat> I want to give you a heads up that today we're talking about injustice. I'm going to be saying some things and sharing some things today that at times are not very pleasant. I'm also going to show a film clip that is a little bit hard to watch. And so if you have been in a place of grief or in a place of trauma of some kind, um, if you need to just not be around for that part, or if some of this is a bit difficult today, and you'd rather just kind of jump off and watch this on YouTube later, where you can stop bits and fast forward and things, then I do completely understand. But I did feel like I was meant to kind of go there on these things. And, uh, but I'd also like people to be informed and I have a huge value of people of, of trauma informed education. That's why I wanted to mention that to you to share that with you tonight. OK, so I want people to feel safe and comfortable, but also want to do what, you know, obviously what I feel the Lord's kind of leading in that. So I also might be a bit more of a preacher than a teacher on some of this stuff tonight, because this is a big this is the big part of my heart that we're going into here. So you might get me. I might get going a bit. We'll see. <clears throat> the one thing I want us to see. From this passage and this promise about Job is that it is saying that the promise of the Spirit really does mean everyone, available to all. And so 
And sadly, I have seen in my life from things that I've been involved in over the years, men seeing themselves superior to women, white people seeing themselves as superior to other races, children being seen as insignificant toys that can be abused. I've lived and worked in places and situations where men have paid to have sex with, trans, with, a, with transgender women and gone to a conservative church with their family on Sunday morning as if there was nothing wrong. I've worked with Somalis and other African refugees that were kept in refugee camps for 14 years because the rest of the world wouldn't help them find a home. I've come across men that were forced to sleep in dirty blankets in a shed and told if you don't work out in this field for 16 hours a day, someone will, someone will go back and kill your family. If we believe the promise of the spirit, if we really believe that the promise of the spirit was for all humankind and creation, then we would be a lot more equal than we are right now. You see, Joel does not say the spirit shall be poured out on only men, only white people, only the respectable, only the people who go to church, only the able body. He says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And I love how the day of Pentecost the initial pouring out of the spirit for all in terms of that prophecy. I love how Pentecost speaks of our modern day issues with racism that have just come up so much in the last few years. In that the people in Pentecost included black Africans that went back to Africa and planted churches, Middle Easterners of all kinds. In fact, it is more than possible that on the day of Pentecost, there wasn't a single white person to be seen. And, sorry, I'm going to go back. And so the promise of the spirit promises to address gender bias, poverty bias. It's tough words when God says that it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Religious bias, the love that we're meant to have for people of all faiths and none. Could say a lot about that. Disability discrimination. You know, we use the term in the work I did in the United States of differently abled rather than disabled. One of my missionary heroes in terms of my initial missionary training was a man named Tom Brewster who spent most of his life in a wheelchair as a missionary. Racial discrimination. Isn't it interesting that Paul has a go at Peter in the book of Galatians for not being willing to sit with his friends? I'll never forget standing in a queue in a supermarket in Michigan where I overheard a woman two aisles away from my own saying, I came back to Michigan because there were too many black kids in the local school where I lived in Florida. Gender bias. I battled in one of my own home churches that I was a leader in for years to get women elders to be installed in the church. I didn't succeed, but there is more women, female influence there now than there was. <laughs> Keep on fighting. Slavery. Isn't it interesting that in Revelations 18, it talks about corporate greed and the trading of human beings. You know, there's more slavery now in the world than all of past history combined. The Holy Spirit helps us and by leading us into all truth in terms of critical thinking. In my work and my teaching, in research, I talk about a critical thinking lens of historical context, complexity, and unintended consequences. And then you have migration. There's more migration in the world, again, than at any other time in human history at the moment. At, um, and as Christians, do we see that as a threat or do we see it as a thrill? The Bible is full of examples of migration, Ezekiel, a refugee in Babylon, 
Abraham leaving not knowing where he was going. Ruth basically ended up as an immigration farm worker. Um, Moses was the same. Jeremiah going to Egypt. Jesus was a refugee. In my own personal work, we actually in plan in Norwich to actually begin in YWAM, a University of the Nation School of Migration Studies next January. And so you'll hear more about that. When I worked with the refugee agency I worked with, I'll never forget a guy, I'm gonna call him Billy, who worked with us. And I saw him one morning and I'll never forget the look on his face. And I said, Billy, you look different this morning. Why do you look different? He said, I've just found out last night after 12 years that my father is still alive. Our church home group in Colorado um, planned a special party for a woman who was a single parent mom who'd come from the wars in West Africa. And um, I'll call her Julie. And we gave her a birthday party. And she told me after the party, at uh, 40 years of age, it was the first birthday party that she'd ever had. I could go on. I'm gonna show you a video now and say a few things about it afterwards. So you should be able to hopefully hear this come up. She was four years old. The first time a man looked at her the way a man looks at his wife on their wedding day. Little girls are supposed to dream about being models and doctors and veterinarians. Instead, she fought sleep eyes wide with terror of another night greeted by her stepfather's shadow. He was a real monster in her bedroom and mom. She was too fragile, too selfish to accept the truth that her little girl's innocence had been stolen one night when her boyfriend decided she wasn't good enough anymore. And since the little girl never had a real father, she accepted his advances because he always promised her his touches were acceptable because he loved her. When you don't know yourself and you don't love yourself, you will fall for anything that sounds like love and feels like love. She was a walking corpse stained with the fingerprints of strangers. And all she wanted was to walk the earth without the heaviness, the weight of all the men who tore a piece of her and took it with them. She never made it to see her 18th birthday. This is for the pain, for the stains that bath water won't wash away, for the scars left on the hearts of the fatherless child. This is for the girls objectified instead of praised like queens. This is for the agony, growing up without a father, but all you really want is love and you don't understand love. So one day when some guy stops you in a train station or a street corner and tells you you're beautiful, you are quickly intrigued. You like the fact that someone notices you and you will do anything to feel like it's everything. And he promises you everything and the things he convinces you to do, they don't seem that bad if afterwards he shows you how much he loves you. Your morals are abandoned on that sidewalk where you turned your first trick. Your beauty is left in that hotel room where some stranger touched you like his girlfriend and then left the money on the nightstand. And every night you die again, compromising your worth for what your pimp calls love and security. The hustle, the street lights, the schemes, it never seems worth it, but you have the liquor to comfort your fears. And as long as your profits meet expectations, you will have what you always wanted your whole life. Love. Love that doesn't feel right, but it's all you think you're worth, so you take it every day. You sleep when the sun comes up, rise when the sun is down. Conceal the torment with makeup and stylish hairdos. Put on your best outfits. Something arousing because you have to make them happy. The men, the tricks, the pimps. This is for the pain. This is for America. In hopes that you will notice that 12-year-old girl who was forced to trade her lunchbox and sneakers for a Chanel purse and pumps. This is for the 16-year-old girl kidnapped by a gang of men on her way to school and held captive in a house right next door to you. This is for the 20-year-old girl who took her last beating today because she couldn't bring herself to let another man hold her down and violate her. We are all slaves for love, degrading ourselves for acceptance of a man that's the closest thing to a father figure we've ever known. We were once just girls with aspirations and a small piece of hope. Now who will notice us? Who will save America's daughters?
I worked in a region of California where there was no concerted combined effort to deal with modern day slavery and human trafficking. And I haven't got time to go into the story of how it happened, but I ended up helping to co-found a coalition for that region of California fighting in that area. And one of the things that I did was I worked as a human trafficking um, prevention specialist in foster care homes and in what in America is called juvenile hall. And the number of girls that self-reported as victims with stories that have similarities to the stories of the girls and the survivor that wrote that poem is um, disturbing to be polite. The area of California that I worked in, the Guardian newspaper recorded back in 2015 that um, as of December of that year, 13 people had been killed up to that point um, in situations involving law enforcement officers um, in that region of California. In the same time period, that we're in a population of 875,000. In the same time period, in New York City, with, a, with a, a population of 10 million people, only nine had been killed in the same period. The Bakersfield, California newspaper reported that in 2019, black people in the region where I worked were four times more likely to be pulled over than white people. And I worked with a lot of incredible, wonderful people that live in those communities in California. So I'm not trying to paint a brush of everything not being good because we had an amazing um, experience of being able to be of help to people that wouldn't have got help otherwise. And, um, and that thankfully continues. Now, you might be thinking to yourself watching that video, well, wait, hold on a minute. Well, that's America. I mean, that doesn't happen here. Injustice and mistreatment are everywhere. Just in the area in Essex where I grew up, which is Thurrock, I just threw this out as an example. July 2019, the Thurrock Gazette, which was the local newspaper that I grew up with, reported that there are 700 cases of missing children just under Thurrock Council care. Where do you think those girls are? When you've got that number of missing children, the majority of them are almost always female, and it means a lot of the time that people are being trafficked into the sex industry or they're being used for forced labor. In June 2020, the BBC reported about county lines here in Norwich that 20 networks had been shut down, which is brilliant. But the problem is still going on. And in October 2020, they reported actually that even though there's less dealers, Norwich, the Norfolk still actually has more of a problem with county lines than Essex, even though Essex has over twice the population. We've still got a problem of boys being horrendously used out of London and other large cities to bring drugs into our city. And if you remember last week, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And we talked about that in terms of the gospel largely, but then he says to go along with it as gospel, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to, to recover sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. You see, the gospel is not just a proclamation of the basics of what we talked about last week in terms of the realities of Christ. The gospel is a two-handed gospel, a gospel of both proclamation, of, de of, of um, declaration, but it's also a gospel of demonstration. And if one's missing, then the other one, then we've always got a problem. It always has to be both. And I was teaching a class in a... Uh, <clears throat> actually not in a faith-based environment. And I was sharing about uh, modern slavery and human trafficking issues and a project that I'd worked on um, in this class. 
And a lady put her hand up and she said, uh, what motivates you to do this work? And I thought, hmm. And what came out of my mouth, and I think if I can say this in a class about the Holy Spirit, I think it was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I hope so. Um, I said worship. You see, there are lots of people of Christian faith, other faith and no faith, doing fantastic work to fight injustice. So what makes us different as Christians? I want to suggest to you that the most significant difference among there being a number of differences is that we are doing it to serve people, to love people and to love, to love humanity, but we're also doing it to minister and bless the heart of God. And that's what worship is. And James 1.27, I'm just going to unpack this for you quickly, but I want you to pay quite close attention to this. And it was a, because I know it's evening, you probably had long days, you might be tired, you might have only eaten half your tea, I realize it might be a little tricky, but I really want you to get your head around this if you can, because this is potentially life state changing stuff here. I've had people come back to me two years later after me sharing this saying, oh my gosh, in a good way. True worship, of which the Father approves, is to take care of orphans and widows in their distress and to stay unspotted from the world. True religion. The word religion there is one of the five Greek words for worship. It actually means ceremonial worship. Some people might want to call it even bells and smells. But it's a, it's, it means worship. True worship of which the Father approves is to take care of orphans and widows in their distress. This is talking about the vulnerable. James was talking about the vulnerable communities that existed in Jerusalem at that time. Well, who are the vulnerable communities now? Refugees. Immigrants, seniors in our community that are in deep social isolation, people struggling with mental health, with the, with the problems of lack of mental health services, maybe. So, so far, what we have in this, in terms of the way I'm going to translate it for you, is true worship of which the Father approves is to walk with the vulnerable. And now we get to the big one. You can see on your screen there <laughs> what I'm about to say. All of our Bibles, except the New American Standard in English, and by the way, I just want to mention, I've done teaching um, over the years in Albania, and when they, uh, when they translated, when the Bible was translated into Albanian, they got this right. So I just, I'm, I'm quite pleased about that. So, but true worship, of which the Father approves, is to walk with the vulnerable. And then we have that word, and to stay unspotted from the world. In the original language, that and is not there. And I've got to tell you, a huge amount of work went into me saying that. There's a lot to be said, even by James, about the responsibility of teachers. <laughs> so this is actually what James, what he's saying here. He's saying true worship, of which the Father approves, is to walk with the vulnerable to stay unspotted from the world. In other words, true worship before God is actually going out and getting your hands dirty. It means that... One of the ways in which we worship in spirit and by, by truth is actually living out Jesus' words here of the spirit of the Lord being anointed to demonstrate and declare the gospel to the poor. Wish I had more time, I don't. I'm going to keep going with that. But yeah, isn't that amazing? True worship, of which the Father approves, is to walk with the vulnerable to stay unspotted from the world and you see and in Leviticus 19 you actually have the same thing 
um, than equivalent of James 127 in the Old Testament. In Leviticus 19, you've got God saying, be holy for I am holy. Now, if I were to ask you what you, how you thought about what a holy life looks like, we tend to talk about morals. We tend to talk about how we live and what we do and what we say and what we watch and what we read and all of those kinds of things. And I'm not saying tonight that that's not important. But what I am saying is that, that we're so focused on that that we've lost the other side of the important part of the story. Because Leviticus 19 says, be holy for I am holy. This is God speaking. And then he goes on in these verses to say, feed the, feed the poor, pay people their wages, help the differently abled, treat the elderly well, and be a blessing to immigrants. So the inference of this is that if as a church and as people that are worshiping God are not feeding the poor, not paying people their wages in our businesses as Christians in the way that we should, not helping the differently abled, treating the elderly well and being a blessing to England, then we're not really living a whole, you could argue, where are we really living a holy life before God? I mean, I know that's a bit of an ouch, but this is a social justice thing here. Yeah. And I really believe as a church, we need to think about these things. I'll never forget, I was doing a training with some dear friends in San Francisco. And I said, I shared this with them. And I said, everything that you are doing to serve the poor among the people of San Francisco is motivated to bless the heart of God. So what you are doing is, is worship to the Lord. It is much an act of worship as anything that we do, singing, you know, or whatever we do in our worship on a Sunday morning. And some of the people in that group had tears in their eyes. So as a way as a part of our worship to God, we come as agents of healing. We come alongside children and teens and the abused. And I'm going to wrap this up by bringing the context of Holy Spirit in this. Micah 3.18, I am filled with the power of the Spirit of the Lord and with justice. Isn't that cool? And Zechariah 17, sorry, Zechariah 7, 13, he's just told people to not oppress the same words almost as James, to not oppress the widows, to be a blessing to the fatherless, to, <clears throat> again, to serve the poor. So Zechariah 7, he's saying this, and then he speaks about them not being obedient to what had been said before. And he says that the Lord Almighty has sent by his spirit and he's referring to the words that I mentioned last week in Isaiah 58 and the words of Jeremiah that say the same thing. So the words spoken about the need to serve the poor and the vulnerable in the Old Testament, he said, had been sent by the Spirit of God. He says, administer true justice, so, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow and the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. And he says, they refused to pay attention, turned their backs and covered their ears and made their hearts like flint. They did not listen to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. Isn't that something? So. I want to encourage us to realize that this whole issue of injustice and things that are being done to people in the world and the way we treat one another, the systemic side of it as well in terms of the responsibility of churches and denominations and Christian organizations and governments and non-governmental organizations and entities, you know, we also stand in that in terms of where are we a part of the systemic problem of some of these things that I've spoken about this evening as well. The Holy Spirit wants to rise up. And when we look at the prophetic next week, I'll mention a few more things about that in terms of what we look at next week as well. So I'd like to close with two prayers. 
It's a, they're, they're a little bit long prayers, but just um, if you look to the Lord in this, I think that these are things we can take to God and for our prayer this evening. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I think of, I might have overlooked too many people. I might have avoided people you love. People who have a bad reputation, people who are irritating or ill-tempered, people who are from a different social background to me, people who look untidy or smell unclean, people who embarrass me, people who disagree with me. Forgive me for living a life that is unlike yours. Forgive me for receiving your abundant love and then failing to share it. Lord, improve my eyesight so that when I see others, I can see how much more you love them and then join in with your love. Give me the courage today to open a conversation with someone I've previously avoided so that the glory of your love is seen as a fraction more in my life. Amen. And may the God May God bless you. And this is, the, so this is the Franciscan Christmas prayer for justice and peace. And I'll close with this. May God bless you with discomfort. At easy answers, hard hearts, half truths and superficial relationships. May God bless you so that you may live from deep within your heart where God's spirit dwells. May God bless you with anger, that injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people. May God bless you so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war. May God bless you so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world, in your neighborhood, so that you will courageously try what you don't think you can do, but in Jesus Christ, you'll have all the strength necessary. May God bless you to fearlessly speak out about injustice, unjust laws, corrupt politicians, unjust and cruel treatment of prisoners and senseless wars, genocides, starvations, and poverty that's so pervasive. May God bless you that you are all called to remember, we are, sorry, we are all called to continue God's redemptive work of love and healing in God's place, in and through God's name, in God's spirit, continually creating and breathing new life and grace into everything we touch. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.